was at the end of their rope. Their daughter suffered from severe mental illness but refused to accept treatment. They felt like their only option was calling the police for help but worried that that would only make things worse. And so they did in a last ditch attempt. I can tell you're all holding your breath, but this is not a sad story because instead of police officers, the people who answered that call were trained counselors. They spoke with the daughter and helped her agree to accept treatment. Then she walked to the ambulance herself. Cases like these, where the response has been constructive rather than destructive or even violent, have made people across the country take notice. People are asking themselves, what if instead of sending police officers to some 911 calls, we could send other responders, like doctors or even trained counselors? Unfortunately, people with mental illness are more likely to be the victims of police violence than many other groups, regardless of whether or not there's any criminal activity involved. And so today, we'll take a look at these programs. After giving some ba background knowledge, we'll look at what they are and why they work. I've been a part of Denver's alternative policing program called the Support Team Assisted Response, or STAR Board. This program sends an EMT and a mental health professional to respond to some 911 calls. It's been incredibly successful. So let's look at exactly what these programs are. When you call 911, your call will be routed through a civilian call center. They'll answer the phone and try to figure out from your story, along with other hints and clues involved in the call, what response is the most appropriate. In the past, they've had options like a fire response, the police department, or even a medical one. And what alternative policing is, is adding extra options to that scale what we call the continuum of response. This is incredibly valuable because it means that emergency response can be more adaptable, and it means that when people are in crisis, we're getting them the resources that they need. This call triaging process has been so effective that Denver Star Program has been able to answer more than 3,000 calls and has never needed police backup once. Of those 3,000 calls, the majority were either welfare checks or related to the unhoused community, with significant overlap between those two groups. Welfare check calls, in layman's terms, are just the team going out and making sure that someone is okay. Maybe they saw the somebody on the street without any shoes on and want to make sure that that person is connected with what they need. And the calls responding to the unhoused community are just as important. Many cities are seeing these alternative response initiatives as a great way to mitigate homelessness crises that we see across the country. That's because responders are equipped to provide things like counseling and even rent assistance. That's incredibly valuable and takes me to why these programs work. Because in my opinion, the best thing about these initiatives is their connection with resources. In the ideal world, they can get people the things that they need. I mentioned rent assistance earlier, but that's just the tip of the iceberg because there are so many connections and services offered in cities. What we need is to get people through the front door. And that's where alternative policing comes in. Cities across the country are implementing their own unique versions of these programs that answer their city's specific needs. For example, the nearby city of Aurora is experimenting with the idea of follow-up. After somebody has made a call, they actually send responders back to the scene of the same call to make sure that the people involved are still doing okay. Because the factors in your life that might drive crisis don't just disappear. It requires time, and these initiatives acknowledge that. The city of Chicago also has something innovative going on. Their, their department is combined with the Department of Public Health, meaning that their responders are taking a public health approach 
rather than a punitive criminal justice one. This has also significantly aided in their drug crisis, like the ones that so many different places are experiencing. One of my personal favorite programs being implemented is in the city of Rochester, New York. They have a way of doing follow-up that is incredibly effective. There, after a homicide is committed, they send in counselors to make sure that the family is doing okay and to help them through what is one of the most difficult times in their life. This is not only showing care and compassion when people most need it, but it's also had the impact of reducing retaliation, meaning that these programs are literally saving lives. And finally, in the city of Atlanta, their programs sprang out of a strong LGBT community, and they actively recognize that the history between queer people and law enforcement is often violent, and that they're trying to bridge that gap and be different. When I talk about these programs, one of the most common responses I get is a concern that they might threaten police departments. But if we come back to Denver's program, we can see that that doesn't have to be the case. Our police chief has been integral both in founding and expanding the STAR program, and that's amazing. STAR has also held up its end by sending liaisons to police briefings to talk about how officers can best take advantage of all of the resources we provided. This has been so effective that about 20% of our calls actually come from police officers who redirect the call. They arrive at the scene and then decide that their resources might not be the best to address what's going on, and then call in the SAR team. That's a symbol of effective communication that is incredibly valuable for these programs. Another concern that comes up is whether or not these responders are being kept safe. Although Denver's program has never needed police backup, it is still important to have a triaging process that takes into account the distinction between violent and nonviolent cases and makes sure that all of our responders are being kept safe because that is still the number one priority. And finally, there are of course financial concerns. But if we look back to the city of Aurora, we can see that it's actually saved the city money. That's amazing. That's because it keeps people out of jail, it keeps people out of dangerous drug overdoses, and it ultimately brings the community together. So, for people in power, if your city has a program like this, support it. Try to find out what they need and what connections might need to be made in order for it to be the most effective that it can possibly be. And if your city doesn't have a program like this, develop one. Find out what someone else is doing well, any of the examples I gave, and find out what might need to be changed, what needs to be adapted for your specific needs. For the people working in these programs, we have to network and make sure that the community trusts us and that we are worthy of that trust. Because one of the biggest challenges in law enforcement right now is the lack of trust. So let's be different. And finally, for the community, because you are the most important part. We often forget as community members that the police are supposed to work for us. These programs are long overdue, but it is not too late. I am proud to be part of the movement for alternative policing, and I hope you will be too.